Okay, so welcome. Today I'm uh, recording uh, the lecture rather than live streaming. We'll be back to live streaming on um, on Wednesday. Um, so just a reminder, last time uh, we spoke about, uh, this is kind of our first example of altering the transformation group to talk about a different type of geometry. So our basic example here um, was changing the Euclidean isometries of the plane uh, to this isom plus R2, which were the direct isometries of the, or the isometries of R2 uh, that were made up of an even number of reflections instead of being made up of up to three reflections, right? So it's just even number of reflections here are the only isometries that are allowed. And so we're restricting um, our isometry group or our transformation group we're restricting it uh, and changing it in a way, and this changes the geometry that we talk about. So now this is oriented Euclidean geometry, uh, meaning that orientation becomes a thing that is actually preserved by the isometry. So typically, um, an isometry does not preserve orientation. Um, orientation, unfortunately, is one of these uh, silly concepts that if I wanted to describe to you like... Uh, in detail, like conceptually what orientation is, then it's actually, it gets a little complicated. Uh, basically, an orientation is a sensible choice of a direction, right? So uh, one example of that that we used to illustrate this point was uh, the notion of clockwiseness around a circle, right? And so as we saw, um, the notion of a, some set of, say, four points being clockwise around a circle was not uh, it was not preserved by normal Euclidean isometry. So if you just reflect across the x-axis here, um, this definitely does not respect or preserve clockwiseness around a circle. Uh, but if we restrict our transformations to be these uh, direct isometries, or these isometries made up of an even number of reflections, then um, it does, in fact, respect those things. And so we have changed the geometry. Now this is something that... Uh, now, clockwise order is a thing that is a meaningful concept in this type of geometry. Okay, now that might seem a little, maybe not, uh, not so uh, amazing uh, of an example, but, you know, it's, it's a simple example here of, of being able to change the transformation group to change what the geometry is doing. You might say, well, it's not really a totally different geometry. It's just Euclidean geometry where you can talk about you know, a sensible notion of orientation. Uh, and that's that's true, but we'll see why, um, you know, understanding this uh, clearly is going to be uh, so powerful for us going forward to, to see how we can alter uh, the, or talk about these groups. Um, you know, we're going in the backwards direction now, right? So we're going to be talking about these transformation groups, and those are going to be, you know, illuminating the path geometrically uh, for what we're going to be doing. Okay, so um, it turns out, so talking about these transformation groups is going to be very important, and it turns out um, that uh, many of these transformation groups so many of these transformation groups um, in question uh, are uh, what are called matrix groups. I'm not going to say anything else about that, uh, i.e. they are groups that are, these are mathematical groups, they're, they're groups uh, that can be thought of as uh, sets of matrices with some conditions. Okay, so sets of matrices of some size, of some conditions. Um, this is one thought, or one way of thinking about it. Of course, when we define transformation groups, um, these groups, right, were sets of functions and the binary operation in question was function composition. Okay, um, what we're going to see is that there is a nice correspondence, typically, between these transformation groups where we're thinking about functions here, right? Functions f, 
that are our transformations that you know that we're investigating these are our transformations we want to investigate what things these preserve and there's going to be uh some correspondence between f so some thing some transformation some function in this group and a matrix m right there's going to be some correspondence between f and some matrix m and what's going to happen is our normal binary operation on the transformation groups is uh, function composition. Uh, that binary operation is going to correspond to matrix multiplication over here in the matrices. So you might already know where this is going. Um, and I can't remember if I actually assigned this as homework or put it on uh, your exam, but um, uh, I'd have to check. But uh, this is actually something that we did uh, back when we first talked about linear fractional transformations. And I'll, I'll go over that um, a little bit later. But anyway, so there's going to be these correspondence here. So where do these come from? But where do the matrices come from? All right, so in this picture that we have come up with so far for these transformation groups, where would the matrices come in? Well, here is where the chapter three and chapter four approach, especially the chapter four approach, is going to uh, come in here to, to show how the matrix groups are related to our original description of these of these groups. So, um, so where do the matrices come in? Uh, recall in chapter four. So in chapter four material, uh, we treated R two as a vector space. Okay. And remember, a vector space is is a vector space that is over a field. So R2 is a vector space over R uh, was one of the ways that we viewed this. And so the scalars uh, here were in, they were R, they were in R, they were real numbers. Um, and so that's where we got the field axioms, right? So we didn't need to do the projective geometry construction that we did in the last couple of chapters, we actually just got the field axioms because R2 was a vector space with vector addition and scalar multiplication, right? And so, uh, just to refresh your memory, if we had two vectors, say U and V in R2, um, then defining their vector sum, this was just uh, exactly as you would expect, so I'm not going to go over what the notation is here. You know what it is I mean when I say this. So summing two vectors was done by just summing their two components, um, uh, multiplying, doing scalar multiple CU of vector uh, was scaling each component of that vector by some scalar C. So C was uh, just some scalar. Okay. Um, and so uh, what transformation uh, would we talk about in R2 uh, that respects the structure of the vector space? What's well, a linear transformation? And so, um, also recall, a linear transformation. So a linear transformation, F of R2 uh, preserves these two operations. So we have these two fundamental operations, vector addition and scalar multiplication. They encode the entire vector space structure for R2. Um, and so if we want to talk about preserving the entire vector space structure of R2, uh, all we need to do is preserve these two things. And so a linear map is the, or a linear transformation is exactly one that does that. And so um, this means that firstly, uh, F of U plus V uh, is equal to F of U plus F of V. And so it sends vector sums to a sum of vectors, right? So vector sums get sent to vector sums. And secondly, uh, I can pull scalar multiples, I can pull scalar, sorry, out of linear functions. And so it sends a scalar times a vector to a scalar times a vector. Okay, so this is the notion of a linear transformation.
Of course, you can combine these to say that what are preserved are linear combinations, right? That's another way this is, uh, uh, this is called. So why is this called a linear transformation here? Right. So this is called a linear transformation uh, because, for one thing, it maps lines to lines and it preserves the straightness of lines. Okay. So to see that, uh, so such transformations are called linear. So such transformations are called linear because they preserve straightness of lines. Okay, so how do I see this? Uh, so to see this, note that uh, one way of writing a straight line uh, in R2 was as uh, the following linear combination of vectors. So I have two vectors, A and B. I have the linear combination A plus TB, where T uh, is running through all real values here. Okay, so how does this specify a line? What are the roles of these vectors? Well, uh, to see that, let's say that uh, I have my origin here. So here's my origin. Uh, if I have my origin, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, say write my two vectors a and b. So let's say here is a. Right, here's my vector a, and here's my vector b. Okay. And so, what role uh, do these things play? So I can think of a being a, a single point on this line and I can think of B as specifying the direction of the line. How do I how do I do that? So recall in a vector space in general of course I can do this but um, here in the plane I can actually identify this point itself with the vector A, right? Vectors I can identify with points in this way. Okay. Alright and so once I've done that how do I get my line? Well it's just the line specified by the direction of B. Right? There's my there's my line, and so a generic point on this line would be my point A shifted by some scaled version of B, and that's what I get. Okay, so this is why A plus T B is is my generic form of a line. Okay, but note. What is f of a plus tb? Well, using those two properties that I had on the previous page, let me flash those back real quick. There they are, one and two. So using those linearity properties that define a linear transformation, this is f of a plus t f of b. So the proper way of viewing this is f sends, so a linear transformation sends a thing that is vector plus scalar times vector to vector plus scalar times vector. Okay, so this is a line, right? So this is also a line. This describes a line. This right-hand side is a line itself. So it maps lines to lines. Okay. All right. Okay. Thus, um, furthermore, right, if I wanted to think, uh, so let's say that, uh, note, if, uh, say L1 and L2 are two lines with direction B, then F of L1 and F of L2 are two lines with direction F of B. Right, just from how this is written. 
Okay. Okay. And so we have a special term for this. If you have two lines and they both have the same direction in this sense, well, those are parallel lines, right? Okay. So if I have two lines, they have the same direction, then they get mapped to two lines, f of L1 and f of L2, that also have the same direction. Now, note this direction is not necessarily the same as the direction of the first two lines, but the transformed lines, f of L1 and f of L2, both have the same direction, and so they're parallel. And so, thus, linear functions or linear transformations also preserve parallels. So it preserves straightness and it preserves parallels. Okay. All right, so that explains to me where linear transformations or what linear transformations do geometrically. Where do the matrices come in? So um, you, you know, you might recall from a linear algebra course um, that when you talk about a linear transformation, you're basically talking about a matrix transformation. So there are some exceptions, um, and you know, you might remember examples of those exceptions um, from your linear algebra class. But uh, if not, that's fine. But just know that. Um, Linear transformations and matrix transformations are already intimately related, and to see why that is, um, you can actually say, uh, so let F be a linear transformation of R2. So it satisfies those two aforementioned properties. Okay. Um, well, actually, this can be specified by four real numbers, A, B, C, D. Okay, so then F can be specified by four real numbers. That we'll call A, B, C, and D. Okay, how so? Well, um, any point X, Y, and R2 gets sent by F to the point AX plus BY, CX plus DY. Okay. Why? So here's a proof. So first of all, um, F, you, and you might recall, right, how this was done uh, in linear algebra. So um, in linear algebra, you would have used slightly different notation here. You would have talked about um, the standard matrix associated to uh, a linear transformation. Uh, and so, uh, and the standard matrix was something that you could find by seeing where the transformation sent the standard basis vectors. Okay. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to use all of that uh, notation or terminology uh, because I don't need to. I can just, I can basically say that without rattling off a bunch of those definitions. Um, so the point is that, uh, say, f of 1, 0 has to equal something. That has to be some vector, right? So f of 1, 0, so f of the point 1, 0 has to get sent somewhere. And we'll call that wherever it gets sent uh, AC. Okay, so it gets sent to some point. Whatever that point is, we label the x-coordinate A and the y-coordinate C. Similarly, f of 0, 1 gets sent to something, uh, and we'll call that something, uh, whatever its coordinates are, we'll label its x-coordinate B and its y-coordinate D. Okay? All right. But, but note, any point x, y can be rewritten using vector notation as the following sum, you'll recognize this again as the statement that 1, 0, and 0, 1 form a basis for R2. Like I said, I'm not even going to mention that. 
So the point x, y can be rewritten as the scalar value x times the vector 1, 0 plus the scalar value y times the vector 0, 1. Okay. So then what does that mean? It means if I'm trying to determine a generic right, value of f of a point x, y, what is this? Well, using this sum, this is f of uh, x times 1, 0 plus y times 0, 1. Mm, there we go. Actually, I, I only needed two of those parentheses. That's okay. All right, but then um, because f is linear, of course, I can factor the, I can pull the x and y through it because they're just scalar. So this is x times f of 1, 0 plus y times f of 0, 1. Okay, uh, but f of 1, 0 we called ac and uh, f of 0, 1 we called bd. So this is x times the vector ac plus uh, y times the vector bd. Okay, but now I can multiply this. So this is uh, this is ax plus by. So, or, sorry, so, well, here, I'll, I'll do it in two steps. So this is ax, ac, or sorry, uh, ac, uh, cx. Right? So this is ax, cx plus uh, by, dy. And now I can do vector sum here. So this is uh, ax plus by, uh, cx plus dy. Okay. So just like we said, any generic point x, y gets sent to something of this form. Again, you've probably already realized, ah, this is exactly where uh, the matrices come in. Okay. So then, uh, but recall that the transformation I'm not going to rewrite it, it's this one. I'm going to box it and forget about F for a second. So boxing that transformation here. So that transformation is usually represented by a matrix M that is the matrix A, B, C, D. Okay, where A, B, C, D are all real numbers. And so here's my matrix M. And so how do we view this matrix as being the transformation that I've boxed here? Well, I view this as happening via matrix multiplication, right? So if I multiply my matrix M here by the vector XY. So now I write my vector XY as a column instead. Okay, and if I just follow normal matrix multiplication, this becomes, so A times X plus B times Y in the first slot, and in the second slot, C times X plus D times Y. All right, okay. Okay, so that's how that goes. All right. And so we can see that this matrix M is associated exactly to the transformation that I've boxed here in this way through matrix multiplication. Okay. Now there's a few things to say here. What's nice is that if I consider the product, that is the composition of two linear transformations, I can do this as the product of two matrices easily, right? So um, note uh, the product, so this is the composition of two linear transformations, so one and then the other uh, can be realized as the matrix product of two matrices. Okay. All right. And so actually, you know, it's not even, not even that tough uh, to do this. Um, so, you know, if I, uh, if I do say, uh, 
you know, uh, let's say that I do my first uh, transformation is it sends point uh, from, so I'll call this F sub 1, and it sends the point X, Y to, uh, say, uh, A2, X plus B2, Y. Uh, and uh, C2, X plus D2, Y. Uh, and then uh, I have F2. I know that it's confusing because F1 goes here. It's so that the order looks nice uh, since I'm going from right to left. Uh, yeah, from right to left here. And F2 uh, sends, uh, we'll say, um, uh, the point X, Y to A sub 1, X plus B sub 1, Y. Uh, and C sub 1, X plus D sub 1, Y. Um, so then these two... Uh, transformation so me doing f sub 2 composed with f sub 1 which is you know f sub 2 f sub 1 we write it like that um, or you know what this actually is of course is f and 2 of f sub 1 right of x y that's what we're thinking of here well this is actually just a product of two matrices and it's to see what is the product of I look and I have the matrix product here uh, or so the product here I'm reading it left to right but if I were doing this I would do it you know from right to left as functions but for matrices I could write this as a product here is going to be the matrix associated with f sub 2 uh, and here's the matrix associated with f sub 1 so I'll call those two matrices m sub 2 and m sub 1 and what are those it's going to be uh, a sub 1 b sub 1 c sub 1 D sub 1, and A sub 2, B sub 2, C sub 2, D sub 2. And if I multiply those two matrices, then I get uh, the following 2 by 2 matrix. So I get A1, A2 plus uh, B1, C2. All right, so we get A1, A2 plus B1, C2. In the first slot, in the first row, second column, I would get uh, A1, B2 plus B1, D2. So A1, B2 plus uh, B1, D2. Okay, in the uh, second row, first column slot, I would get uh, A2, C1, or C1, A2, we'll call it. C1, A2 plus D1, C2. And then lastly, in second row, second column spot, I would get uh, uh, C1, B2 plus D1, D2. Right? And so that, this matrix, would be uh, the matrix that is associated to this uh, transformation I would get from first doing F sub 1, then doing F sub 2. Okay. All right. Now, note, um, also nicely encoded in this matrix business is, you know, one of the earliest things you talk about when you first define matrices and you start doing algebra with them is the notion of a matrix inverse, Right. Um, and, you know, intuitively, if, you, if multiplying by a matrix takes you forward, then um, multiplying by the inverse of the matrix takes you backwards, right? So it makes sense, just like normal multiplication. Um, and so, uh, of course, we know that whether or not a matrix has an inverse, uh, it's not as simple as it is for scalars, right? If scalars, if you're not zero, then you have an, a multiplicative inverse. But for matrices, it's whether or not your determinant is zero. And so... We know that isometries typically are these nice things that, uh, you know, uh, have inverses, definitely. And so these transformations we're talking about, if we want them to have inverses, we better, since they're associated with some matrix like, like this, we'd better talk about the determinant. So note uh, for M, that is a 2 by 2 matrix, A, B, C, D, to have an inverse... we need the determinant of M uh, to be non-zero. Right? That's true of matrices in general, not just two by twos. Uh, but what is the determinant of M? And the determinant of M, just to remind you, is AD minus BC. So this is the condition that we would need if we wanted to guarantee inverses. And if we're in this case where we definitely have an inverse, for a 2 by 2, there's actually a very nice, easy formula 
for the inverse of a matrix and m inverse is 1 over the determinant of m. See why we have to have this be non-zero. So it's 1 over the determinant of m times uh, I swap the main diagonal entries, so d and a get swapped here, and I negate the off diagonal entry, so minus b minus c. If you multiply that out, you'll see that m times m inverse, or the other way around, is that's the identity matrix. Okay, so just a quick refresher on some of the matrix algebra behind this stuff. And so now we see where linear transformations give rise to matrices. Okay, uh, and going back a little further, so linear transformations give rise to matrices, but linear transformations geometrically were these nice things that preserve straightness of lines, and they also preserve parallels. Okay, uh, they actually preserve more than that. Um, they also preserve the origin, right? So they actually preserve the special nature of the origin. We'll talk about that at the end of this little subsection. So now let's talk about some examples of linear transformations, because as it turns out, um, the linear transformations actually uh, are a bit too floppy. Um, they're a bit too floppy because they, they contain uh, too many transformations. So um, the isometries of R2 are inside them in some way. Okay, so the isometries of R2 live in them, but there are plenty linear transformations that are not um, that are not isometries of, of R2. And so, um, note any 2 by 2 matrix, so I write that as M 2 by 2 here. So any 2 by 2 uh, matrix uh, M with real entries So eternally, when I'm talking about a two by two matrix, uh, unless otherwise specified, this is the notation that I'm using here, A, B, C, D. Um, so any uh, two by two with real entries um, represents a linear transformation. So this is a linear transformation of R2. Uh, to see that, you can just think about matrix multiplication. So if you take this thing and you multiply a vector sum, then by properties of matrix multiplication, this is linear in the sense that m of u plus v is m of u, uh, m times u plus m times v. Uh, and similarly, uh, m times scalar times u is scalar times mu. Right. Okay, and this is true for any vectors u and v in R2. All right. um, now, if we restrict our attention to invertible m's, right, and we have to do that if we're talking about isometries of R2, uh, because if we don't, uh, then uh, we... Uh, we have some issues here. Now, not all of the isometries are um, live uh, among these matrices. Only some of them do. You'll immediately see which ones don't. <laughs> um, you'll immediately see which ones don't. Um, so if we restrict uh, our attention uh, to invertible in, Okay. Then certain isometries of R2 uh, are among the linear transformations. Obviously, they need to be invertible since all the isometries we know are invertible. Okay. So certain isometries of R2 are among the linear transformations. We've already seen this um, once. So recall, there was an alternative way of defining a rotation without specifying the exact angular value directly, right? This was, we did this to avoid um, having to deal with functions that were, uh, you know, not algebraically nice, right? We didn't want to have to actually deal with trig functions in an analytic sense. So um, we skirted around this by instead 
dealing with the actual functional values of those things, right? And the way that we did this is we dealt with uh, scalars C and S, which of course stand for the cosine and sine values of the angle. Uh, and uh, we saw, so in chapter three, we saw uh, that uh, a rotation in R2 is a transformation of the form Uh, so it takes a point or vector x, y and sends it to uh, c, x minus s, y, uh, s, x plus c, y. All right. But of course, this is just a matrix, right? But i.e., this is associated. This is just multiplication by the matrix R. That I'm about to write here. So this is associated to the matrix R, which is uh, the matrix C minus S, S, C. All right. This is the matrix that rotates in this way. All right. And we actually proved back in chapter three that this weird thing actually is a rotation, right? It didn't look like it just looking at the definition here, but it turned out this was exactly the rotation that that you wanted. So if you actually picked the values of C and S corresponding to the cosine and sine values for whatever angle you wanted to rotate counterclockwise through, um, then that was exactly the rotation that, uh, that uh, it should be, right? Um, and recall also, okay, that uh, reflection in the x-axis is the following linear transformation. So reflection in the x-axis is the linear transformation uh, so reflection in the x-axis is a linear transformation that uh, sends the point x y to x minus y uh, but what matrix does that so that's given uh, by we'll call it uh, x bar so uh, is given by the matrix X bar, which is uh, 1, 0, 0, minus 1. All right, it's almost like the identity matrix, but it reflects across the x-axis here. Okay. So this also gives us any reflection in any line through the origin okay uh, and that is by combining these two okay so actually uh, these two examples give us reflection through any line going through the origin okay so note these two examples uh, give us any reflection across a line that passes through the origin. How? So how does this work? Well, um, say that we have any line L through the origin. So say we have a generic line L. Well, it's not totally generic. It passes through the origin. So say we have a line L passing through the origin. So we have a line L passing through O. And I want to see how um, I can use those two. That is some rotation uh, and reflection in the x-axis. How can I use those to reflect across L? Well, the idea here, right, if I draw the actual picture here, uh, I have x and y axes like this. Here's O, my line L. Who knows? I don't know. Maybe it looks like this. There's L. What do I need to do, right, in order to uh, 
in order to reflect across L, right? So if I want to reflect a point x, y across L, what would be the process to do this? The idea is I currently know how to rotate a point like this about the origin through some angle, right, counterclockwise. And I currently know how to reflect across the x-axis. The idea is to rotate this line L to make it the x-axis. So if I'm not doing anything too fancy here, I'm just rotating counterclockwise till this L matches up with the x-axis. Then I can reflect my point, right? I can reflect my point across that line, the result, since, I, since now the line matches up with the x-axis. Can reflect the whatever the, that point is going to get rotated as well. It's going to get reflected across the x-axis, and then it's going to get rotated back. Right? Then the idea is once I've done that, I rotate it back. Okay. And so rotate, reflect across the x-axis. So rotate until this is lined up with the x-axis. Reflect across the x-axis. Rotate back. Okay. You did an example of this in the homework. Um, in back in chapter three uh, and so the question is uh, what does that end up you know what's the end result there the end result is exactly what I want okay so first uh, apply um, we'll call it R inverse to send L to the x-axis okay then carry out reflection via our reflection matrix X bar. Then send the line of reflection back to L by applying R. Okay. All right. But rather than writing all this out in words and me trying to explain it in pictures, it actually has a really, really simple description if we just use matrices, right? So just using matrices, um, I, uh, I could just say, well, this, so to reflect IE, to reflect U, uh, across L that passes through, so passing through the origin, uh, passing through O, I'm just going to say passing through O. So to reflect U, which is my generic point across a line passing through the origin, uh, I just find, uh, R X bar R inverse U. So, as a product of matrices, this is very short to write. Okay. Okay. So, um, linear transformations include isometries. Um, so the invertible linear transformation includes some isometries. They don't include all of them. So, uh, and they don't exclusively include isometries. Okay, so there are uh, plenty of examples of invertible linear transformations that are not uh, isometries. Um, and so I'll, I'll give one here in a second, but also I wanted to say, um, there are also examples of, um, isometries that are not linear transformations in this way. Okay. So you might have already seen that we've been, uh, we've been skirting around some. So what were our two examples, right? Our two main examples was any rotation is good, right? Any rotation is fine. So this covers all rotations. And so actually any rotation is covered by this. Okay. Reflection across the X axis is okay. Reflection across the Y axis is also okay. 
Using these two, we can reflect across any line that passes through the origin. You might think we're getting close to saying we got all isometries because there's the three reflection theorem that any isometry uh, is a product of up to three reflections at most. Now, what's the problem? Um, those reflections in general allow us to reflect arbitrarily across any line we want, not just lines that pass through the origin. And that's where we come into problems. Okay, because it turns out that um, if, you have, uh, if you have a linear transformation, um, it doesn't move the origin. Okay. Um, so uh, that is the key thing. So it doesn't move the origin. What does that mean? I'm telling you, it doesn't move something. Well, what is something that definitely moves the origin? Uh, translations, right? Uh, so translations are perfectly fine isometries for us, but they're not linear transformations. They're not linear because they, uh, they move the origin, and linear transformations don't. So I'll say what I mean there in a second. So um, thus, linear transformations... include all rotations and all reflections across lines through the origin. All right. But um, they don't include translations. So we'll get to that in a second. So they don't include translations. Also, there are invertible linear transformations that are not isometries. Okay, so if you were wanting to know some converse Question, unfortunately, there are linear, there are invertible linear transformations that are just not isometries. Here's an easy example. Um, scaling, right? Dilation in a factor. So dilation, here's an example of a dilation. Uh, it takes a point or a vector xy, sends it to, um, say, kx times y. So k is just some scale factor, some real number. All right, so take uh, k to be positive, right? Take k to be positive, so k is not zero. Then uh, this is uh, given by the matrix. We'll call it S for scaling. So uh, the matrix in question is k, 0, 0, 1. This is an invertible matrix, right? The determinant is just k. So if k is positive or negative, we're good. Um, but uh, this is not an isometry. It's easy to see that it's not an isometry. It doesn't preserve... Uh, distance, for instance, right? I mean, this is a scaling, right? This is this is not uh, this is not good. In fact, any invertible linear transformation is a product of reflections and lines through the origin and stretches in the x direction. Okay, and so uh, in particular, you can actually expect these dilations in general to to show up, right? Uh, so maybe I'll say that fact just because that's a nice thing. So uh, actually, every uh, invertible so every invertible linear transformation is uh, a product of reflections across lines through the origin and uh, dilations in the or scalings in the x factor. Okay. By scale factors that are non zero. Okay, because if they're zero, then the determinant in question is zero, so it wouldn't be linear or it wouldn't be invertible to begin with. Okay. So, note translations aren't linear transformations. That seems very weird, right? And you think in your head, like, hey, wait, translations, if 
way back or not way back, but earlier today, I mentioned like one of the things that linear transformations did for me is that um, they preserve straightness. They preserve parallels, right? Well, translation definitely preserves both of those. So how is it that preserving both of those is not enough to guarantee that I'm linear? What, what goes wrong here? So to think about this, uh, note if um, any linear transformation F is linear, then F of the zero vector must be the zero vector. Why? Well, here's a proof. So, um, note that a vector minus itself, right? This is the symbol we use when we mean u plus minus one times u. But a vector minus itself is always the zero vector, right? There's no, absolutely no issue here. Thus, um, what is f of zero? Well, f of zero can be thought of as f of u minus u, right? So it's f of vector minus itself. But because f is linear, this is f of u minus f of u. But this is a vector, and this is the same vector. So this is zero. Huh. Right? In fact, in linear algebra, right, the, your 240 or 461 course, this is actually one of the ways that you checked whether or not this was, you know, it wasn't completely deterministic, right? It was possible that you had transformations that satisfied you know, that they sent zero to zero, but they weren't linear. But this was one easy thing you could check, whether or not a, a transformation was linear. It has to send zero to zero. But translations don't do this, right? No, translations fail this. Well, translations that translate by any vector that's non-zero. So, but, by, but translations by non-zero vectors fail this. since they definitely move the origin. Okay. So, translation by non-zero vectors. Fail this because they definitely move the origin. Right, so even if you're, you know, even if you're translating by vector one zero, right, that definitely moves the origin. It moves the origin from zero zero to one zero. Okay. So, um, so it fails this. All right. Um, so what is it that that is being said here? Thus, um, linear transformations. Uh, respect or preserve the origin that is they demarcate the origin as a special point i.e. they distinguish it as a special point okay Right. But um, it, it shouldn't be, right? <laughs> it shouldn't be a special point. Um, it, it should be uh, geometrically no different from any other point, right? Like Euclid does not make reference to the origin. Um, none of that was needed, right? It's, the idea was any point was the same as any other point. Um, and so we, we don't want this special point. We don't want the origin to have its special status. Um, it turns out that translations are an example of something called affine transformations. So that's where I'll start uh, next time, and we'll continue on from there. So um, I'm not going to go through all of Chapter 7, um, 
So I'm not going to go through all of chapter 7 uh, right now. Um, I am uh, I'm basically, once I get halfway through it, I'm going to go ahead and go to chapter 8. And then we may come back and look at some of the special stuff in chapter 7 a little bit later if we have time. But uh, I really want to get to chapter 8, and the latter half of chapter 7 is not needed to talk about chapter 8. So anyway, um, so I'll stop here for today. That's uh, that's enough, and I will see you all on Wednesday. Wednesday will be live uh, again, um, and like I said in the announcement, your um, your homework, if you need a little bit more time on it, that's fine. There's no no late penalty. If you need a little bit more time even than Wednesday, that's okay. Just, uh, just let me know. So anyway, um, okay, so I will uh, see you all on Wednesday.